So welcome everyone to the final session on the final day of Big Blue Bunner World 2022. It's been yet another day filled with interesting and exciting work showcased from outside, inside, and around the community. And I think that this last session that we have coming up is going to be a really interesting one and a really good way, I think, to uh, you know kind of finish off the conference and everything like that. So I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who's attended every day or who's attended even one day, one session. We really appreciate all the participation, all the interaction, as well as we also really appreciate the participation and taking the time out of their day um, on behalf of the speakers who come out and are presenting their work. So let me introduce the three speakers that we have. So joining us today for our final session is Clemens Gruber, David Sika, and Imogen Husing, who on behalf of the eLearning Academic Network and Osnabrück University in Germany, present their talk on improving the usability and accessibility of Big Blue Button. So this talk was gonna be split into kind of two parts. So Clemens gonna take the first part to discuss the vision of the technological necessities for Big Blue Button under GDPR and usability viewpoints. And then the second part of the session, David and Imogen will present some key findings and put forward redesign proposals for UI sections that regularly cause friction for participants. So I think it's gonna be really interesting. I hope you guys enjoy. Thank you, you three, for the time. The floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, I will talk about improving the accessibility of Big Blue Button. The background of this is that we have, we got some money from the state of Lower Saxony. And uh, as Rudiger mentioned in the last talk, um, we will support work from Blindside um, for the accessibility part of the big blue button. And um, accessibility is a broad uh, area and I like to talk um, about live captions and um, especially about support for hearing impaired uh, persons. So, um, I'm really happy that um, Emil Trogala from the Hochschule Bremen is also here and uh, he can uh, support us uh, with um, really expert uh, expertise and um, some, some thoughts about this. Um, we have talked last week um, at the German community meeting of Big Blue Button at the University of Osnabrück and um, I think we have here some um, insights also um, about uh, the yeah live captions and some um, improvements for hearing impaired persons. So the first thing I want to talk is about live captioning, not only for hearing impaired persons, because in case you are um, not a native speaker, um, captioning is also um, su supporting you. Or if you are in the bus or in a, a loud environment, you can also follow videos with captionings, also without any audio. So let's have a look at Big Blue Button at the current state. Um, live captioning was possible or is possible a long time in Big Blue Button, but it's a special captioning service. So you have to activate it and you have to type in the live uh, captioned text. So um, yeah, it's not an automatic process. You have to be really fast in writing and uh, in typing. And to uh, make this in the most cases, you will have professional typer, um, transducer and uh, in case it's working, you have as user the opportunity to click on the CC button and you will see the captions under the uh, slides. So we have done this for a meeting um, of two hours and we uh, yeah, booked a professional service for this and we paid, as you can see, 900 euros for two hours. So this is extraordinary in, um, to have this, this, this money for, uh, for a conference. So it's, it's really not cheap. And we are looking forward to other and uh, yeah, let's say automatic um, solutions. So, but um, the professional captioning service um, uses most own software solutions and use APIs. So um, in case um, we say, okay, we have big blue button 
Um, the, the captioning service we, you've seen on the slide before would not be possible to uh, make the captions because they say, okay, we have our own software and we have only, we support only products with APIs that can uh, be connected to our uh, software solution. And we have their um, supporting tools like uh, yeah, grammar and uh, other things. Um, so uh, this is this is a lack of big blue button, no API. Um, Fred has uh, had a talk on, on, on Tuesday about captioning, and there was a um, separate track of the MCONF team about automatic captions. And uh, I'm really happy to see the presentation and the videos in the future from this too. Um, like a short summarize about uh, this presentation in the current, in the 2.6 version, automatic speech recognition is will be implemented. That's a great news, um, but it will be um, a Google service that makes the translation. And this is, especially for us in Germany, not GDPR conform. So we are not allowed to use the service at our university. And um, yeah, our wish is that we have an ASR service agnostic API in Big Blue Button um, that can connect, um, for example, to EmberScript, a uh, commercial service, or to WASC, Kaldi, an open source product. And the next thing I'm what I want to talk about is how the captions should be um, displayed. So we like to have the captions flexible. Um, the first thing is that we uh, like roll-up captions or rolling captions. We have a look at it. So in the most cases, you have two, two lines of captions and they are coming in and flying out and rolling captions working a bit other. We have two lines, and if the first line is done, the second line jumps to the first position, and new content comes in at the second position. And in case time is gone, same again. It jumps up, and new content comes in. So this is a more usable um, behavior of a captioning service and YouTube has it also. So we like to see this in Big Blue Button um, instead of these pop-up captions. Sometimes people are not only uh, hearing impaired, but also um, visual impaired. So we like to have the captions adjustable. This is important because um, somebody cannot read it if it's too small. So um, we like to have the size and the color adjustable, background color and the font color. Also the text position because it's an, it's an overlay over the um, slides. And sometimes there are interesting things and important things on the slides and you want to move it on another um, edge of the slide. And we like to have the numbers uh, customizable because uh, sometimes it's interesting what's on the um, on the slides, and you uh, want to have uh, not too much space for the captions. And in another presentation, uh, there is not much information on the slides, and you say, "Okay, let's have a, a great amount of text as caption." It is also important that the speaker has an indicator. So in case um, two people are talking in a video conference or more, um, in case you have only a text uh, transcript, you will not notice that uh, another person is speaking. Um, so we need this also in the captioning service that uh, a speaker has changed. And at least, we like to have all captions at one page. 
This is an example from OpenCast. Um, there is an opportunity to see the captions as a kind of chat window or whatever uh, you may, may call it. And uh, this is to have an overview over the captions. And uh, also it is um, not so easy uh, to follow um, a talk with captions only. You have to be very concentrated in case you are not concentrated or you there is uh, some, some door ringing, doorbell ringing, and you are out and you cannot find in. And so it is important to jump back to go to a position um, where you are out and to see what happened there. So an ongoing requirement would be if you have a uh, recording that you can upload um, new captions or download first the automatic um, generated captions and then uh, make some editing, make some improvements and upload it again. This would be also nice. Um, at all this discussion about um, the captioning, you should not, um, you should always have in mind that for a lot of people, the native language is the sign language. So captions are good to have and it's better than nothing, but the preferred language is the sign language for a lot of people. And as you can see here, it's a German um, example, um, sign language is different to um, the spoken language um, or the text uh, language um, we are using in the captioning. So uh, this is also important. It's, it's not a fully replacement um, for sign language captioning. So more video customizing options, not only for hearing impaired people, second part. This is uh, a text from Merle Evans. Uh, she is uh, hearing impaired, but not deaf. She can hear something, but not so good. And uh, the uh, most interesting information she got is from the lips. So she, she's lips reading. And this is okay for a yeah, normal situation, face to face, but it's difficult in uh, a video conference. Why? Because um, the stream and the audio, the video stream and the audio stream is not in sync. So you have lip movements um, different to the audio stream or the video is not so good because it's blurred and it's hard to follow this. And uh, in case you have a look at the presentation at the moment or this slide, you will see a really, really small uh, area and it will not be uh, feasible to, to, to uh, lip read um, from this tiny uh, video picture. So um, let's have a look at uh, the software who um, the name must be not spoken. Um, you can move in this software, the video part from one side to another side, and you can also um, shift the video to an external, to a second screen. And we like to have this also a big blue button to have really a big picture of the uh, person that is speaking and to have it separate from the other stuff on the big blue button uh, video conferencing UI. So the other thing here is sometimes annoying. It's not the best solution, <laughs> let's say this also, but for this special case, it is great to have an extra uh, window and to have this on the second screen. So we have also sign language interpreter here in the session. And um, in case you follow this person, you read the hands, you read the face also, and the lips, of course. And you have sometimes two of them. So pinning one video is not enough. 
So in case you have, uh, this is a picture of the Big Blue Button conference um, in Osnabrück last week, and the size of the um, sign language interpreter is round about that what you will see in a video conference at Big Blue Button at the moment. So it's not doable in this case. So the requirements are for this um, special situation, we have to pin more than one video because in a, in, a, in a longer term, in a longer session, there are two persons, they are switching, and you don't know when the, they are switching and uh, you have to have all two um, in focus. We want to remove the other pe the people, or not the people, but the videos, to have more space for the sign language. And we want to have it in, in a separate video. And the good thing is, it is doable with Big Blue Button at the moment, but only with Firefox as web browser. Uh, Firefox has the opportunity uh, to uh, make the video um, in the browser uh, separate and to move it also to the next um, uh, yeah, display. But this is a workaround and it would be great to have it not only for Firefox working, but for all other browsers also. We are talking about uh, video, but as Rüdiger mentioned in the last session, it would be also helpful to have, let's say the chat or uh, whatever the presentation area only um, in a single window to move it to another uh, screen. So I really love the concept of Big Blue Button that is all in one window. It's not confusing also for grammar school and for, for primary school, they can handle this in Big Blue Button and uh, they have no overlay. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a good concept, but for some cases we need this flexibility. So this is an example of uh, from Golden Layout. You have uh, some different areas and you can move with the, the mouse cursor over um, this icon and can open this part of the screen in a new window. And you can move it then also to a new, um, to a second screen. So this about uh, the hearing impaired uh, possibilities and wishes. And it's a small, uh, yeah, um, uh, small look out at dark mode and high contrast. Um, Fred mentioned this um, in the session. Um, it is good working with uh, the high contrast mode also. Big blue button, but in case you switch. Uh, micros off or cameras off, the icons are not very uh, differentiable. So you have the same icons with a, with a tiny uh, line on it. And it's, yeah, for visual impaired people, but the standard <laughs> is better because you have colors there also. So uh, have a look please at this and uh, have also the high contrast mode uh, in mind, uh, not only a dark mode. And uh, yeah, that's from my side and I would pass over in case there are uh, no... So yeah, I have to no questions in the, in the chat or we make it um, at the end, and to David. Is David there? Uh, yes, Ingo, we will start. Okay. Yeah, uh, I just have to quickly upload our presentation.
So the next presentation is um, from a human-computer interaction course at the University of Osnabrück, and I'm happy that uh, David and Imogen will present the outcome and also some, uh, yeah, improvements, perhaps. Yeah, um, as Clemens just mentioned, we are two students from a, a human-computer interaction course uh, from the University of Osnabrück. And in our seminar, we uh, conducted a usability test of Big Blue Button. And yeah, we, I will just start with the presentation of our, yeah, with our presentation. Um, so um, as you all know, great usability is one of the most important goals of Big Blue Button. And since we are students ourselves, we have collected quite some experience with uh, BBB over the last two years and knew that the core functionalities, especially for participants, were already integrated um, quite well. But um, since we mostly participated as students in the, um, yeah, in the listener mode, um, we didn't know as much about the other functionalities. And so, in the seminar, we um, conducted a usability te test that was focused on the more extensive functionalities necessary to, for example, run a lecture or a seminar. And um, yeah, to investigate this, we um, uh, used tasks that are representative of this uh, seminar or... Is there... Okay. No sound. Okay. I can hear you quite okay. well. Okay, good. Uh, I was just confused because there was no sound in the chat. Okay, then I'll just continue. Um, yeah, for this presentation, we try to condense our results that we gained from this usability test and um, yeah, we try to present them in a way that might spark your creativity also, and we hope that we can have a, a lively discussion at the end of this session. Okay, I will uh, give you a brief introduction to the evaluation and the methods we used for the test um, in the beginning, but uh, the main focus of the presentation will lie on our findings because I think they are the most interesting. And they are split up into um, four different parts. Um, first, I will introduce you to the participants' general impression in form of a usability score. Um, then David will talk about um, some usability problems we found and also some uh, redesign proposals um, that we came up with. Um, and then I would like to close out with um, positive remarks and also uh, missing features that came up. And yeah, during our presentation, we invite you to take notes um, so um, we can, you still know uh, all what is, know everything about what you wanted to say about the different design proposals at the end, and we can have a really nice discussion and maybe come up with uh, new ideas of how to um, tackle some of the issues we found. Okay, so I will just quickly talk about the evaluation. So what did we do exactly? We did a usability test of uh, BBB um, 2.4, uh, where we focused on the functionalities that are prominently used for online seminars. And how did we do that? We um, gave our participants a script of that resembled a seminar session, and the script consisted of tasks which we asked the participants to complete. Um, these sessions were recorded, and the recording was then showed back to the participants, and we talked through uh, the recordings and especially asked um, yeah, what went wrong at the places where they um, uh, couldn't complete the task or were struggling. Uh, for some time. 
And finally, the participants also filled out the SES questionnaire, um, which is one of the most prominently used questionnaires and which helped us determine the um, yeah, overall perceived uh, usability of BBB. Okay, so um, who is we? We are, as I mentioned briefly in the beginning, um, a group of students from the University of Osnabrück who participated in a human-computer interaction seminar held by Professor Hamburg of our university. And this usability test was uh, commissioned by uh, the university's Department of Digital Teaching, aka Virtuos, which uh, some of you might already know from the last few um, sessions. Um, yeah, and our test participants were uh, all students, and most of them were also already experienced uh, with Big Blue Button, but not necessarily in the role of the presenter. So there were a lot of new features for most of them. Now let's get into the findings. Um, first, let's talk about the general impression of the usability of Big Blue Button. So um, we use the SUS questionnaire. Um, SES stands for a system usability score. So uh, the test consists of 10 questions um, that uh, are get rated by the participants. And with this, um, with this ratings, you can determine a score between zero and 100, uh, the so-called SES score. And um, this kind of this is kind of a nice uh, possibility to quantify the respondent's general impression of the usability of the product. Okay, so now what's the score for Big Blue Button? Um, in our research, um, we obtained an average score of 63.5 for Big Blue Button. And compared to other uh, software products, this is uh, below average. Um, there are two larger uh, studies that have collected SES scores from a huge variety of different products, and um, the average score in these two studies was around uh, 67 and 70. So, yeah, um, Big Blue Button is a bit below that. Um, however, this result it might sound a bit harsh, but it has to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, because firstly, we had um, not a lot of participants. And um, so there might be some outliers. Yeah. <laughs> and secondly, we don't really know what the softwares are that were um, evaluated or that were looked at in the two studies. So it might be that they were much simpler than um, this uh, online conferencing tool. And also, we believe that um, the usability score can actually be improved quite a lot um, when we look at the problems we found. And yeah, David will now talk about um, the usability problems and the um, our redesign uh, solutions. OK, um, great. now that we've heard about the um, general impression that our participants had of the usability of Big Blue Button, um, let's take a closer look at the concrete problems um, our participants faced as they were trying to uh, solve the tasks that we gave them. This may give us a better idea about where the insufficiencies that the participants indicated in the questionnaire actually derive from. And um, we found here quite a lot of little issues that caused a bit of hassle here and there. Um, so we will not be able to go into each and every one of them in the duration of this talk. So instead, we will focus on those problems that occurred for a great portion of our participants and all limited usage uh, rather strongly. So again, to make this clear, none of the uh, problems we found poses an impairment that requires an immediate hotfix or something like that. But we did, ident we did identify some areas of the Big button user interface that could be revoked to um, smooth the user experience at least a bit. Okay, then let's first have a look at what users can do when connection problems occur. Um, we gave participants the task to uh, take measures to reduce their data consumption. This is the uh, translation of the task that we gave them. Um, 
and in Bitlu button 2.4 there were two ways in which users could reach the options for data savings. You could either click on the small symbol in the top right that displays your connection status or you should or you could um, go via the settings. With the introduction of Big Blue Button 2.5, however, the options were removed from the connection status menu and are now accessible only by the settings. Um, but our findings actually suggest that um, the data savings options should also be available in the connection status menu um, for um, yeah, many three different reasons. Firstly, enabling data savings is a feature that users will require relatively often. So getting to this feature should require as few clicks as possible. And obviously um, just clicking on the connection status icon is um, yeah, just one click while going by the settings requires uh, in total three clicks. Um, and secondly, three of seven participants checked um, this connection status button first before taking a look at the settings. And thirdly, leaving the feature in the connection settings menu would allow to increase users' awareness about the existence of this feature, which uh, would be important because in our test, only one of seven participants knew that the data savings option existed. And, and yeah, remember here that our participants were experienced in using the blue button and will therefore likely have faced uh, connection problems before. So. Um, which they then likely weren't able to adequately handle due to their lacking awareness of the existence of the data savings options. Uh, we think therefore that increasing the awareness for this feature is rather important and for that, um, one option for that would be to have the connection status button not only turn red when, connect when the connection becomes worse but also undergo further visual changes which make clear that this button is actually clickable, which three of seven participants did not realize. For example, it could get a more button-like appearance um, with a lettering that would stabilize or something similar. Um, then let's see what the data savings functions um, or the data savings options uh, functionally hold. One option here is to um, completely leave um, all other participants' webcam streams. And the other option is to disable the screen sharing feature. And here two of our participants said that they were a bit disappointed by these options and had expected more graded options that are not as black and white, perhaps, as the current ones are. Um, and together with these two participants, we then came up with additional data savings options that might be useful. Firstly, an option to um, throttle the transmission quality of the webcam and screen sharing streams and secondly an option to specify that not all webcams should be displayed but for example only that of the presenter or only that of the presenter and the sign language interpreter. An implementation of this could look as follows. We see here the three options I just talked about and then here the option for leaving the uh, screen share stream completely. We see that they are grayed out here because they are subordinated to an overarching function called stabilized connection. Um, our reasoning behind this uh, stratification was that if you want to stabilize your connection, you mostly don't want to think about four individual options um, and decide what might be a suitable setting for each one, but you're under time pressure because you don't want to miss what anyone's saying. So um, by this design, we'd have to click just a single button which would then in turn um, activate reasonable default settings for um, all four options. Yeah, so for example, the stream quality for the uh, webcams and the screen share could be set to low and only the webcams of presenters and moderators could be shown. Okay, then we turn to the next area where we identified problems which is the uploading of slides. Um, participants here had the task to open the presentation with the blue button. So again, we did not specify that they had to upload it as a file. Um, this already led to the first problem, which is that three participants were not aware that they could upload their slides as PDF files. 
and then simply open the slides on the desktop and share the screen. And so here again, we have a lack of awareness about the existence of the feature. And, and the second problem is that um, all participants took quite a while to find out where they could actually um, upload the slides. So two subjects even uh, surrendered after multiple minutes of searching. And the others explored an average of seven other areas in the application before finding the correct, the correct um, function here under the Actions button. During the search process, um, two other areas were particularly popular. First, the button with the uh, flipboard icon here, and which is where three of seven participants started the search. And secondly, the uh, central area here, which also, um, or where also the button for screen sharing is located. Um, three other participants started their search here. And as we can see, um, the, functional sec the functionality is actually placed uh, below the Actions button, which is here marked by a, a plus symbol. And um, it shares the space with uh, three other functionalities, which all have in common that they are only accessible to the presenter but otherwise there isn't much uniting these functions. And as our test shows, participants do not expect them to be there. Um, so for the presentation um, managing function, I just explained this, but we also tested, for example, the uh, polling function and uh, obtained very similar results. So we would suggest to place these functionalities where our participants tended to expect them, which um, as I already said for the um, functions that are related to the central area of the screen, namely managing presentations and selecting random user, that would be um, the lower central area of the screen. Um, and this could then, for example, mean that they are placed, these two options are um, grouped together with the screen sharing function in a unifying button. Um, and the other two functions which focus more on the participants uh, could be placed in the participants tab. Um, and if you then expand this button here for the uh, functions that, is, um, that affect the central area of the screen and control what all participants of the conference see, if you expand this button, this could then look, for example, like this. Um, you can see the individual functions, manage presentations, share a screen or share an, an external video. Um, and this could then also be a suitable location for future functionalities that relate to also the central area of the screen, um, which control then what participants see. So such as the extended whiteboard that is in development. If you then want to actually manage your slides, the dialog could look like this. Uh, you see here for each file the uh, first slide, and then the selected file would be marked uh, clearly by a blue framing and a check mark. And here to the side, you see the options for making the file available for download and um, deleting it. You'll notice that um, this is much more compact than the current solution where the same dialog uh, fills the complete window. Um, we have then one more proposal to make, which did not directly arise from the observations we made with our participants, but uh, developed more naturally with, while we analyzed the recordings. And um, yeah, we're talking namely about the fact that Currently, there's no possibility to see the chat without at the same time seeing the participants tab. So you can only see the chat while also the participants tab is displayed. Um, this is quite space intensive, which especially on smaller screens can be um, a significant limitation. And of course, students are mostly limited to such devices. Um, and we want to note that you can make the participants tab smaller just by drawing on the border between the participants tab and the chat. Um, but this is not really a handy solution. It also doesn't look very tidy if you try it out. 
So we would therefore propose to um, introduce a dedicated possibility to minimize and hide the participants tab while the chat is still displayed. This could then, for example, look like this. Um, here you see that uh, already the minimization could make a noticeable difference and free up some extra space on the screen that uh, you could use maybe to um, expand your notes a bit or to see the slides a little bigger. Um, yeah. For such a functionality, you would then, of course, also need um, dedicated buttons. Uh, we suggest here one button for each tab, uh, which allows you to collapse it, and um, yeah, perhaps a slight redesign of the um, hide all button, which uh, one of our participants, uh, which used Big Blue button actually for the first time in the test, uh, twice misidentified um, as uh, implementing a functionality to uh, change your role in the conference or to uh, leave the conference. If you then collapse or minimize the um, participants tab, uh, it could look like this. So you have here then two buttons, one for uh, collapsing the participants tab completely and one for expanding it back again. Um, and you could see the public chat as usual. And then if you completely collapse the um, participants tab, um, we would suggest to have this blue underlay, um, which would uh, yeah, make this a bit more obvious. And if you completely hide all tabs, uh, this blue underlay would also um, perhaps remain for better visibility than the uh, current design, which um, is, as you can see on the upper left, a um, yeah, thin symbol with white lines on a, a dark background, which might not be optimally visible. Okay, these were our uh, find central findings. Uh, we will, um, in the near future, um, refine those findings and then upload them or feed them into the issues, se issues section on GitHub, uh, where perhaps you have a little more time for talking about these. But um, yeah, for now, Imogen will take over again and finish the presentation by talking shortly about positive findings and missing features. Yeah, so um, now onto the positive remarks. Um, this all was like quite critical, but we uh, there were also some positive feedback that came out of the uh, post actional actional interviews, and uh, we didn't want to keep that from you. So, yeah, more than half of our participants said that uh, the central functions were integrated really well and were easy to find, um, especially yeah those um, for the listeners. But yeah. And also, uh, one person mentioned that the private and public chat um, are uh, really well integrated and definitely less confusing than in other applications. Um, and uh, two participants also mentioned that they really appreciate the shared notes feature, which I think um, is quite unique to Big Blue Button. And also, the large variety of functionalities um, um, was appreciated by um, two of our participants explicitly. So um, now to our last point in findings, um, missing features. Since a lot of features are already well implemented, um, there's only one point uh, that um, we can add from our study. And that is um, one person said that um, it would be nice to be able to adjust the volume for each conference participant individually. But um, when we presented the results uh, to Vitos uh, to, for the first time, we were already told that that um, is not an easy fix. <laughs> um, that that uh, is because, yeah, it's this uh, function or the way the sound is handled at the moment um, makes this really, really difficult. But we still wanted to mention it here. So 
yeah, that was the end of our uh, findings. Um, we now want to go into a discussion. Um, and so we um, prepared an overview with our um, uh, redesign proposals. And yeah, if you have any notes, um, we can now uh, talk about them. Um, if you want, you can also, um, yeah, unmute yourself and, yeah, speak your comments and not just write it in the chat. While others are typing, I just want to say very good suggestions. Really appreciate uh, the thoughtful feedback. Some of these we think we thought of before, others we hadn't. And I will say that I think I was the one that tried to get the connection dialog box simplified. So I thought, let's get rid of this data stuff because we know it's, know it's already there. Let's not duplicate it in two different ways. So maybe not the right choice, but very, very appreciative of the feedback you guys have given. Thank you. And I do look, I do suggest opening these all up as GitHub issues. Uh, see what we can do in future versions to uh, improve upon these. And um, yeah, like we're, we really appreciate it. And so guys, we have plenty of time for some questions, some open discussions. So feel free to write your questions in the chat, or if you want to come back, uh, with your microphone turned on, not with the listen only, um, we can definitely make that work and we can have an open conversation if need be. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, I work at a community college and uh, this this was very interesting to get the feedback from students and how they uh, they uh, went about their research, getting feedback from other students, because uh, you know they uh, this is used in college environment, and uh, it's good to know what the students uh, think and uh, how it can help them in, uh, as they utilize uh, this platform. So thank you, David and. Oh, I, I'm going to get in trouble to try to pronounce your name. <laughs> uh, but that was good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, maybe um, one remark to Mero's comment. Um, I, I also found it surprising that only one participant mentioned the um, uh, correction of the sound um, because in my friend group this is like the main critique point of big blue button they all like quite appreciate all the functionalities but um, it can be quite annoying when you are uh, in a seminar where that uh, is mostly consistent of um, of presentations from different students and then one student starts talking and it's quite loud and you want to turn your volume uh, down a lot and then another student takes over and you can't hear anything. Yeah, I agree. To be honest, um, this is a main topic in my moderator's course for Big Blue Button to um, give best practice how um, you may give feedback to people who is too loud, who is not so loud because nobody can see the absolute, um, that there is no metering bar in big blue button. So you can't see yourself how loud you are. You just can compare and you need uh, at least three people to decide um, if one is too loud or one is too low. 
So um, this is um, a main thing, and I would also correct the, your findings uh, towards the way that is an important problem that people sound on different loudness levels. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have one raised hand from Lars. Maybe, so you said that you want individual gain on different people, uh, but what you're saying right now kind of sounds like what you actually want is audio compression so that everyone sounds or has the same volume and that's something you could probably do very effectively automatically so you have a consistent loudness in all of the audio stream and to me that kind of sounds so that that's technically a completely different feature uh, but that kind of sounds like that's what you actually want instead of having to control all of the different audio streams yourself and that's actually i think also easier yeah yeah uh good point i didn't even think of that as a solution I'm just curious for okay. some of the design suggestions you made, did you get a chance to get feedback on those from folks that had given uh, feedback on the earlier uh, or on the initial use of Big Blue Button? Mm, unfortunately not. Um, we only had time to do like one cycle of um, yeah, testing the um, software as it was um, in the version 2.4 and then collecting the feedback, analyzing that and um, uh, yeah, creating the, these redesign proposals um, that um, yeah, should be tackled in the future. But maybe David, you can also say something about that. <laughs> um, actually not so much. But, um... <laughs> It would, of course, be uh, great if we could uh, conduct small uh, iterations of usability tests with the um, with maybe mockups of the um, proposals uh, we end up with um, after we refine them. I could also uh, add here that we um, offered the students from the course jobs, student jobs, uh, if they are interested and at least david i hope that we get <laughs> uh, to, uh, to uh, this arranged for you to further uh, go on with the research and especially uh, validating the designs with uh, users so hopefully we can elaborate on this a little bit more that sounds good We still have lots of time for <laughs> more questions and more discussions. So uh, feel free if you guys have uh, a question, toss it in the chat there and feel free to speak up. And then if there isn't anything, then I think we will close it out. But I see that there's some people typing in the chat, so we'll just give it a couple minutes. Yeah, so uh, we are currently working on a full usability report that's not quite done yet. Um, it will be at, uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks and that will go on to Virtuos, but uh, at least I don't know exactly what's going to happen with that afterwards. But I think it's being written in English, so... That would be my question. If it is in English, then we for sure are happy to forward it to Anton. And otherwise, we would give it to Google to translate it and then forward it. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, we want to share. And as David said, uh, also the plan would be to create tickets from uh, the findings 
where we see that uh, something. And um, in the skip part, I could also say the students were quite uh, active in looking at the existing tickets and solutions. So uh, they found out more and uh, for some of the things they found uh, also that in future releases that is fixed and um, uh, how it is uh, envisioned and maybe you could also get some feedback on this and uh, later on. Yeah, that would also be a really nice feature, Miro, with um yeah, that the voice remains un undisturbed and the image, yeah, gets reduced first. Yeah, just to mention Pablo's idea. Uh, so um, transcoding uh, audio to lower bandwidth um, is not a solution because uh, video is much more bandwidth consuming. So the, the main problem is that uh, the SFU um, provides only one um, resolution for anyone. So you can switch it off, but uh, you can't, uh, as a client, you can't demand from the server a low bandwidth version of, of cam or screen share video. So the only chance a client has is to reduce the frame rate by dropping, um, by dropping uh, frames uh, on the run. You. I think FreeSwitch supports per channel like gain as well. You could have where the moderator, uh, let's say someone's using a microphone. We've seen this happen where someone thinks they're using their headset. They're actually using the built-in microphone on their computer and it's like, you're far away. Um, you could have an option where the moderator could increase the gain on the user's microphone. Now that will increase it for everybody. Um, so it's not so much something that's possible by an individual user because uh, one user one user increase might make it too loud for another user. Um, but you could do it from a moderator's point of view, I think. If somebody had a really low microphone and the moderator could try increasing it for everybody. Yeah, this is possible with the telephone option, isn't it? So on, if you are connected via telephony, if, um, I I you think can DT increase and decrease your volume. I think that you might be right, but I think that I'm pretty sure the DTMF codes work for everything. Like we've never tried it, but um, there are keyboard equivalents that I think you can send to just any channel, but we can check it out. So another question, will there be uh, like, you you will publish a report. Uh, definitely want to open these up into like associated GitHub, GitHub issues so other people can discuss them. Um, and are there plans to do more usability testing uh, in the fall or the winter? Like when we come out with Big Blue Button 2.6, you could critique the new features that we added. And I think <clears> we <throat> even want to get you involved. And in, well, you can you can see we released Alpha 2 of 2.6 today. There's We've added more features. I can't say that we may have addressed any of the usability items we have here. Um, but yeah, just curious if there's more uh, projects ahead in the fall or winter. At the moment, the um, HCI exercise is in the summer. And I think the uh, professor will do also other projects, not only big blue button testing. So I fear uh, it would, would be a bit uh, difficult, but perhaps we can ask um, if a follow-up project is possible. 
I think if we can address some of these items, like not in 2.6, but maybe in the next release, 2.6 is like later this fall, summer, fall, um, we might be able to pick off a few of these and it may not look exactly like you do, but you've identified some areas like the reducing the bandwidth is probably something we should put back into the connection status. Um, we can follow up individually on these and uh, and see if we can make progress on them. And David, Imogen, when do you guys graduate? Like what, uh, what year are you in? Um, I'm in my third year and I plan to graduate um, or yeah, get my bachelor's degree in about one year. Taking a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, I'm also in my second year and I will graduate pro probably in another uh, two years. Yeah. Cool. Again, great work, guys. Great to see. I mean, yeah, uh, um, a bachelor thesis or a master thesis, as proposed in the chat, could also be quite interesting. Um, yeah, I think. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I would really love to continue working um, with uh, on with these results. Unfortunately, I already have another job that I also really love. So <laughs> I'm not sure and how far I can continue with but uh, with this project. But um, yeah, I think David is also really interested in this whole um, project. And yeah. Very good. All right, guys. Well, it's 3.02, so I think this would probably be a good time, I think, to pause the recording.